Good morning, Manchester. <laughs> uh, the potential for small-scale robots is vast. We are all familiar with robots taking over the jobs that humans do. Yet for every human, there are millions of insects and arachnids in the natural world performing all sorts of tasks and missions. Studying those marvelous micro-machines of nature is really, really important. For us to understand what is possible and also to set the agenda for the future for those small-scale micro-robots. Today, I'll be sharing with you our experience with one of those fantastic creatures of nature. So please let me, uh, uh, allow me to introduce Kim. So that's Kim, our jumping spider, that we managed to train in our lab to do jumps like the one you are seeing now. And by doing this, we were able not only to better understand how spiders jump, but also we transferred all this knowledge, hopefully, to the robotics world with the aim to allow the next generation of spider-inspired micro-robots. I remember when we started this work, that was February 2017, and in the kickoff meeting, we wanted to decide which natural creature do we want to study. And I thought I put, that was an item on the agenda of the meeting, and I put for it one hour. But actually, the answer came just in a few minutes. It was a no-brainer almost to study spiders. Why? Lots of insects actually can jump. By the way, spiders are arachnids, not insects. But lots of arachnids and insects can jump. But lots of other insects are simply prey. They just jump to escape with their life. And so they might be really impressive in terms of the distance that they can jump, but sometimes they are just jumping haphazardly. On the other side, spiders are predators. They are jumping to kill. And actually, this photo is for Kim while she was having her weekly meal of a cricket. When you are a predator, you think differently. You understand the environment beside you, you plan a mission, and you perform it in the most accurate and precise way to allow a maximum probability for your hunt. And that's really, really impressive, and I would like our robots to be with that precision and accuracy. But also spiders have lots of other unique innovations. Obviously, all of us know, for example, about the silk line. And in this next video I'm going to show you, that was for Kim, that is what she will typically do before any jump. She will attach a silk line to that jumping substrate you are seeing. And that silk line is actually a safety line for her in case of a missed landing. However, here I must say that she has never missed a task, which was really, really impressive. But also there is this open question, is she, she, are spiders using those silk lines in the air to stabilize their body posture? So that's, that's, that's interesting to answer. The other thing is how spiders generate the forces in their legs when they are jumping. And there is this open question in the scientific area like, do they, do they just rely on their muscles, the muscles in their legs? Or spiders are actually also known for they are able to push and pump some of the fluids of their body into their legs to allow an augmentation for the jumping force. Do they need this augmentation or are the muscles enough to generate those? So as you can see, there are lot, they can really deploy lots of different things and techniques and strategies. And we really wanted to understand that and pick from that the ones that are more suitable to translate to the robotic world. So when we agreed on the spider, I went here to Urban Jungle, the pet shop in Manchester, bought the jumping spiders there, went back to our lab, the microsystems lab in the University of Manchester here, and did the setup. A takeoff platform, a landing platform, two ultra high speed cameras, one from the top, one from the side, and I don't know if you can see Kim, but Kim actually is that small dot there. To give you an idea about how this was challenging in terms of the scale to make an experiment with something that small, she is only 150 milligrams in mass, and she is just one and a half centimeter in length. Once this was set up, okay, then the hard question was, how to convince Kim to jump? <laughs> and there were two pathways to do so, an easy one and a difficult one. The easy one is obviously, she's a predator, we put a cricket or so on the landing platform and ask her to jump for her meal. But we didn't want to do so for two main reasons. The first one is, if we ask her to do that this way, 
she will only do us one jump per week based on what we have observed in terms of how, how many times she eats per week. And that's not good because over the time she can start to change. She is a natural mechanism. She is not a robot, so she can gain weight, she can change her morphology, and then the experiment becomes fraud. The other thing is that one of the main questions of this study was, are spiders able to deploy different techniques and strategies of jumping when they are introduced with different challenges? So if we put a prey for Kim, then probably she will always use her predatory instincts, you know, and always jump in that single strategy. But we wanted to explore more. We wanted to know everything. So the other way, the more difficult way to do that was doing something similar to that to train her, try to train her to jump. And that was, it was the most challenging part of the, of, the, of the project. And we tried all sorts of things. We started by getting a mock-up like a toy spider and started showing him, him we wanted, we want you to jump from here to there like that one. That was the first naive one. Then we designed and built a special tool that can gently handle Kim, and we started moving her herself from the takeoff platform to the landing platform among many other things that we have tried, but at the end she got it. And spiders are really, really smart. And when she got it, she got it. And she knows when we put her on that takeoff platform, we want her to jump, and she will jump for us. <laughs> so, so, so that was good. But among this training process also we learned some stuff. So that, that next video is showing you Kim jumping towards the lens. Instead of jumping towards the landing platform, she jumped to the lens. And this obviously taught us something about where we should put our lens in order not to distract her. But the next video is actually more impressive. Please watch this one. Oh. <laughs> when we saw this video at the beginning, we didn't understand what was going on. Ask him, is, there, is she mad at the moment or she's not in a good mood? What's going on? But when we zoomed in, we find that there were some silk lines from a previous jump that she got her legs tangled in. And so, from a training point of view, we understood, okay, we need to break those silk lines, so not to annoy her when she is jumping, but more importantly for us as engineers, we started to see, okay, how did Kim react when there was an emergency situation? She actually managed to modulate the inertia or, use the inertia of her different body parts to achieve a safe landing at the end. The best possible safe landing, given that she was really, really disturbed in the middle of the air, for her in the middle of nowhere. So that was really impressive, and we are analyzing this video currently to allow to teach our robots to react when they are in such kind of scenarios, unplanned scenarios, basically. Once the training was finished, we started doing the proper experiment, and to do the proper experiment, it's defined based on the challenge. So what is the horizontal distance between the takeoff platform and the landing platform? And also what's the vertical distance? And we measure those distances in terms of the body lens of the spider. So for example, in this case you are seeing this is uh, a three body lens uh, horizontal distance and a two body lens vertical distance. And we, man we managed with Kim to have 15 different challenges that you can see here. Anything above or beyond she refused to do. So this taught us her capability. She is capable of doing such kind of, 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 of jumps. And I'll show you some examples of those. So this is a short jump, just two body lengths, level jump, easy. The next one is actually a long jump, still level, but a very, very long jump. And to put this into perspective, just remember that we as humans, for example, when we want to jump from a standing start, the maximum we can do is probably one and a half of our body lens. This was six body lens. She also jumped low jumps, so the landing platform is actually lower than the takeoff platform. And also we managed to have some very interesting videos of her jumping up. And that's challenging to ask a spider jump up. That's, that's, that's again, it's, you know, <laughs> what she would like to do. We always like to jump to a lower level or maybe level but not up. And if you look very carefully into that video, you can still see the silk line attached from the takeoff platform to her body. It might be difficult to see, but later when you see this video, you can easily see that. So having all those, data, uh, all those measurements and videos, oh, it's time now for us to analyze and understand. And that was a big task. 
And so we started to compare the different jumps and our aim was to understand is Kim deploying different strategies when she is jumping different challenges. And the next video you are going to see is an example of those comparisons. So it's comparing three level jumps uh, and you can see Kim is not doing them all in the same way. So depending on the distance, she will adjust her launching conditions in a different way to allow uh, the landing that she wants. To put this more into con uh, context, we, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, models for jumping that we already have. And through these models, we can define some optimum conditions that, again, is different objectives. One of them, obviously, if I want to jump from this point to the other point, if I want to jump the maximum distance. So we wanted to compare the jumps from Kim with the condition for maximum distance. Was she, uh, was she jumping uh, uh, to achieve a maximum distance? And what you see here, this is just a graph. X-axis is just the horizontal distance, uh, Y-axis vertical distance. And the colors represents the difference between the conditions that Kim used in reality to that optimum condition. And I want you to have a look at where the blue color is because this represents the jumps that were very close to that optimum condition. And what you can easily see from that is that at those jumps that were very, very challenging, either they are really high jumps or they are really far jumps, she will adjust her launching conditions to achieve the maximum distance. But we also have another optima that we can work for, which is minimum time. If I want to jump from this point to the other point in the fastest way possible, irrespective to the, uh, 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 the, the, the energy I'm going to consume. And when we compare Kim jumps to that, look where the blue area now is. The blue area is more towards the shorter jumps. And that's uh, what we got to know about Kim, that she is capable of adjusting her jumping launching conditions based on the challenge that she is presented with. So if, for example, she wants to cross a gap or transverse an, a, a, a hard uh, terrain or, or like a cluttered environment, she will adjust her launching conditions to allow her to do that maximum distance and avoid those obstacles. But if she is predating she, and she wants to eat, she will favor like more of like short jumps that are very fast that will maximize her chances for having a successful kill. We also started doing such kinds of CT scans, very, very detailed CT scans for those kinds of spider speeches. And by doing this, we get a huge wealth of data in terms of the morphology of those spiders, either their body or their legs, the positions of the joints. And this is, these are all very important for us to reconstruct biomechanical models. So by combining those um, CT scans that you are seeing on the screen at the moment, together with the jumps that we have recorded from the video, we can come out with some biomechanical reconstructions like this one. So this like, looks like a video game, and it's basically it is, and it's basically taking the information we had and reconstructing one of the jumps for Kim again. Why are we doing so? Because those things can be, those data, um, those reconstructions, can be used as training data for our robots. So basically to identify optimum, optimum design solutions for motion and uh, for motion and control uh, for uh, complex uh, sensors, uh, sensory and motion. We started as well building micro robots at the small scale. And this is a very small jumping mechanism. To understand the scale, this is a finger on the left hand side. So it's really, really tiny. It's actually smaller than Kim. But this is just a mechanism. It, can, it has like the muscle, but it doesn't have an actuator, it doesn't have a motor, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have a sensor. So that was our very early prototype, but it was important for us to see how small we can get. Then we started building a series of prototypes, and one of them is actually in my pocket here. So that's one of the latest ones we have here. Probably you won't be able to see it, but uh, I have a video for you here for it while it's jumping. And you can see that it's actually, it actually has a motor. So it's an actuated prototype. Uh, what we are currently working on is basically developing the brain. The, um, the brain and the sensor for those micro robots. And to do so, we set ourselves a high challenge basically. So my next photo for you, this one is how we set the challenge for ourselves. We want to develop jumping micro robots that are fast enough and smart enough 
to catch a real fly. We all know that flies are really hard to kill by sweating. We as humans, we can't do so. But taking inspiration from spiders, who are really good ambush predators, we can learn a lot and allow the brains and sensors to our micro robots that can allow us to do such kind of very challenging missions. And this will open, us, open for us a whole new range of applications for micro robots that we can't e even imagine that they can happen. For example, we can, for example, we can use those robots to hunt harmful pests instead of using chemical insecticides. We can use them to widespread sensors in geometrically constrained areas or cluttered environments, among many, many other things. So hopefully, through bringing biological inspiration together with engineering practicality, I believe we are taking serious steps towards allowing the next generation of those future micro-robots that will open a whole world for us in terms of application that will hopefully make this world a better place. Thank you.